Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may find yourself, and welcome to this event on Financing for Sustainable Development, organized by the Center on Global Energy Policy at the School of International and Public Affairs of Columbia University, in collaboration with the Oxford University China Africa Network. My name is Harry Verhoeven. I'm a senior research scholar at the center at CIPA at Columbia, as well as the founder and convener of the Oxford University China Africa Network. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this discussion, um, which will try to draw a number of comparative lessons from both the Latin American and African contexts. As you may be aware, this is part of a series of dialogues, conversations we're hosting. We had one earlier this morning, and I have a number also in the new year on trying to understand the interlinkages between questions around debt, energy transitions and structural transformations in African and Latin American economies and in which we hope to highlight or showcase a number of different perspectives, people from academia, people from the policy world, from civil society to learn uh, as much about what is going on in Africa, in Latin America and what they can learn from each other as well as what the world may perhaps learn uh, from them. In terms of a number of quick housekeeping announcements, it's important to point out that this event is open to the press, that it is being live streamed and that it is on the record, it is being recorded, and that a recording of this event will also be made available shortly after this event uh, concludes. Um, you can ask questions at any moment uh, using the function, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen there. You can type your question, your comment, your suggestion, um, we'll try to uh, engage with those as much as we can and get them to the to the panelists after each of them has spoken uh, for about 10, 12 minutes in their opening interventions. Uh, I'm particularly pleased to welcome three absolutely outstanding guests who I'll introduce in just a minute. A fourth guest who we had advertised, Dr. Wei Shen from IDS in Sussex in the United Kingdom, unfortunately won't be able to join us. We hope perhaps to engage with them at a, at a later stage, but I'm, I'm confident that the uh, quality of the perspectives, the material we're going to be discussing with uh, the three people who are here uh, will certainly not, not disappoint you. Um, so without, that, without further ado, let me perhaps introduce the first, very briefly introduce the first speaker, uh, Obi Ezekwesili, um, who of course is one of the most prominent African voices of the last couple of decades on a whole range of questions as they pertain to international politics, development, sustainable development more, more broadly, one of the founders, of course, of Transparency International, former minister in her home country, Nigeria, and very importantly, I think, for the purposes of our discussion today about financing sustainable development, financing that energy transition, former vice president of the World Bank um, for Africa. She's going to go first. Oh, we perhaps we can turn on your camera and we can, we can see you. Um, she'll set out her opening remarks and then we'll come to our other guest, Ochima Vera and Nicholas uh, Lipolis in, in, in just a minute. But Obi, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us. Obi, I should also add, is currently, if I'm not mistaken, at Yale. Um, and um, Obi, as I said, delighted to, to have you here with us. We're, we're very keen to get, to get your thoughts on this, on this important topic. Over to you. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, I am very delighted to be a part of this conversation. And I'd like to uh, start by laying context. I think that the context for this conversation is an admission that uh, the, the whole of our world uh, is in a season of uh, necessity for new ideas. And new ideas in the sense that whatever served us in the past cannot sufficiently serve us at a time when a global pandemic has revealed how vulnerable the entire world uh, is uh, to challenges that it doesn't have the coping mechanisms clearly uh, designed for. And that therefore speaks to the inadequacy of our current multilateral order to support the process of dealing with global public bads. Um, if there is anything uh, that teaches us a lesson as to the problems that we have with having global uh, commitment and real movement on the, on the issues of addressing uh, the topic that we discussed today, climate change. It is what we see uh, in the current shenanigans around uh, uh, vaccine in, 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 in inequities. And uh, in fact, the inequalities that are very obvious both within and across boundaries of countries. Um, that being said, 
one important point uh, that I want to lay on specifically as I go into uh, how this topic concerns Africa is that Africa's economic growth uh, was already shaky. It wasn't on sound foundation even before the outset of the global uh, pandemic. What that meant was that the continent was growing at less than its rate necessary to tackle poverty. Africa needs at least 7% annual growth in order to make a dent on poverty, seeing that it is the continent which is estimated uh, by 2030 to be the place where 90% of global uh, pernicious poverty would reside. And so at growth lower than uh, 4%, the continent was yet struggling to rebound to the uh, almost a decade plus sustained growth of about five to six percent uh, uh, during before the global financial and uh, economic cum economic crisis of 2008-2009. It is important in the context of our conversation today to remember that Africa's growth was broken in that season because of reckless behavior that happened in advanced economies. There was absolutely no consequence for that reckless behavior. The moral hazards of that behavior was paid for by Africa's own shortfall in growth. And as, as Africa struggled to resume growth, the pandemic has struck. Now, what is the other issue? The other issue related to this is that Africa was already uh, facing the prospects of uh, the, the already facing the impact of climate change. Climate change variabilities were showing up in the low level of productivity of Africa's agriculture sector. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, estimated that in fact, some of the most vulnerable countries uh, to climate change are on the continent of Africa. To that extent, therefore, Africa's necessity to admit that climate change is an issue uh, is a given. However, there is a tension between this admission that climate change is already impacting uh, the continent evidently and the necessity for the continent to pursue its development priorities. The development priorities of the continent would require that the current energy poverty be addressed in a transformative way. African countries in addressing the energy poverty crisis have been, have been pursuing mixed model of a comprehensive energy uh, approach toward green growth. Uh, when you recognize that uh, Africa, uh, one out of every four uh, the, uh, have access to energy, it shows that energy poverty is a predictor of overall poverty. To that extent, therefore, Africa's industrial growth, Africa's prospects for uh, growing its contribution to global manufacturing is dependent on Africa's access to energy. And that is where the conversation around uh, climate change becomes very unjust um, as it concerns Africa. Current conversations seem to suggest that by withholding financing for Africa in those aspects of energy that it would require as it transitions into a low carbon uh, as, uh, uh, continent, uh, would be uh, would, would would be withheld, uh, and and this is coming at a time when we also see that countries that are withholding these kinds of financing are also continuing to subsidize or in fact expand their own portion or or size or scale of um of, of fossil uh, uh, fuel as as a part of the energy solution. So when it comes to Africa, it is not energy security. When it comes to Africa, the most important conversation becomes the impact on global climate. 
that is not the way that the conversation around climate change uh, should go because if it is designed to to uh, if it is designed in that narrative then it becomes hypocritical and it is not based on science it is not based on data it is not based on empiricism and that would mean that we would not be making the most efficient decisions as far as it concerns the last frontier of development, which is Africa. Uh, another set of points for me is that when we talk about the sustainable financing for Africa, in current estimate, Africa needs between seven to 15 billion annually in order to address the impact of climate change already the climate change impact requires adaptation. But what do we see in the global conversation on climate change? We see a less than 20% of private uh, uh, investment uh, or even multilateral and bilateral investment going into adaptation. There is much more appetite for uh, mitigation. Africa's problem is really not mitigation needed at this time. Africa's problem is adaptation. What Africa is facing is what people are hoping they don't face. So how is it that Africa's adaptation problem is not making it at the top of the global agenda in the way that we can assemble the most relevant uh, technologies uh, the most relevant uh, systems of regulatory as a backbone, uh, the most relevant uh, development of technologies and the necessary conversation around uh, policies that address problems of uncertainty that may be preventing the scale of private investment and interest and appetite that could happen. Uh, the, uh, the, third point, uh, the, the fourth point that I'd like to make is that when you think of uh, the, uh, the knowledge asymmetry that exists on the conversation around climate change, it is very clear that Africa itself must take responsibility. That goes to the issue of governance. In the governance model that we see, a lot of the public sector operators um, are not as technically uh, 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 competent in the conversation around climate change issues. And that goes to the heart of the political incentives that drive the way that public sector has been set up on, the, on our continent. That definitely is our internal problem. It is a problem that we have to solve for. The rest of the world does, does not owe us the duty of setting up systems of governance that would be as competent and capable of negotiations as the rest of other countries can. Uh, to that extent, therefore, the investment in the necessary technical expertise that would support Africa's uh, conversation around the climate change agenda, around the decarbonization agenda without compromising its development prospects uh, is critical. And my final point, before I hand over to you, Mr. Moderator, is that for the continent of Africa, it is obvious that as the youngest continent, it is very important an equation when the world thinks of its future growth prospects. I believe that the financing model that looks at climate change, addressing the issues of climate change in a skewed manner without considering what demographics are showing to us uh, in terms of uh, the aging population and the younger population on the continent does not do, does not do justice uh, to the kind of economic modeling that would support our thinking around climate change as a global public bad. Uh, it is necessary that we should begin to think of uh, the way that future technologies would come to the market from the perspective that even such technologies, when they come to the market uh, and, and are absorbed by the continent of Africa, the, 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 it is beneficial to the rest of the world because this continent holds the opportunity for future global growth that is yet untapped. Uh, I do believe that based on the, uh, the, the crisis of, of debt 
that the continent faces are the, the already some 40% of the countries on our continent are at risk of, of a debt, unsustainable debt. It means therefore that the, the, the fiscal space uh, to, to pursue the kinds of investments that are required uh, for decarbonization cannot entirely come from the governments. It must be a conversation that brings to the table different actors, actors that include global institutions, that include the multilateral, the bilaterals, as well as the private sector, and then the continent of Africa. The good thing is that Africa is acting together more and more through the economic integration uh, program of the Africa Free Trade, uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement. It is critical that we should recognize that in moments of global challenges, what we need is more of global collaboration, not building walls and building uh, divisions. Right now, the climate change conversation is divisive and it is skewed against the low income countries. I keep wondering why it is that they can pick on Africa much more than they can pick on China and India. It, it, is, it is clearly uh, this, this matter of looking at the poor level of agency that the continent has mustered in global conversation. And that takes me back again to my, uh, my start of point, which is that if our future is to be guaranteed as one world working together, we must look at the current multilateral order and think of how we can design it for the necessary inclusion, the necessary equity, and the common good of all that is possible through collaboration and cooperation. I thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Obi. Some num number of very important points that I certainly uh, will remember from, from your intervention here. The links, of course, is, as you rightly said, between discussions over financing and political power, political power also to shape the way we, we have this conversation, what is important, who is heard, who is, um, who is not. And I'm very keen to therefore also get the the thoughts of, of another colleague, Tim Avera, who's joining us here from, from Madrid, who is currently heading UNICEF Spain, but who was, of course, the executive director of Oxfam International, and also has plenty of experience in the international development space. Uh, Tim, I'm keen, of course, to you know, listen to your presentation, also get your thoughts on what, what Obi was, was telling us about these, these linkages between political discussions, the way we think about climate change and, and financing. Uh, but over to you, thank you so much also for for being here, it's it's great to have you to have you with us. Well, thank you, Harry, and thank you, Abi, for your remarks, and thanks to the to the university for having me. Um, I'm not going to speak but from UNICEF or from Oxfam or from the couple of universities I've been in the past in the past year, but yes, from the overall experience, I will try to bring to to this to this screen and to. And to the conversation, what's what's my my views on on the issue of this of this panel? And actually, I'm going to to do it through the inequality lens, what is very much, an, I would say, an Oxfam way of thinking, but also across across. And actually, Obi has has also uh, set the scene in that in that way. I will speak a bit about an equal human impact. I will speak about an equal emissions and and decarbonization, an equal climate finance. And an equal participation. That will be the four, the four topics I will, I will go through. I will start sharing uh, my screen if I can. And if, Please do so. Uh, if, if a new conflict does not appear wherever when I press that button. So let's try. Here we are. Yeah. So good. Uh, we have it here. So getting a tweet um, human impact. And I think it is it is important. We all we all know it, but I think it is it is important to to also bring uh, the human the human face of 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 climate of climate change and what it means. Uh, she is Ibado, uh, as an Ethiopian woman uh, living in the Somali region. We met her. I think it was four or five years ago. Uh, there were pa pastoralists. She's living now in an internally this this place camp with her her daughter and her grandchildren. Uh, all the all after several extreme droughts, all her cattle died, and so now they have to to live in internally displaced camp, and all the livelihoods have been uh, fully uh, 
devastated by, by climate change. These are the faces of, of climate change. And it's happening today. Uh, I'm being in, in Spain and in other, let's say, global north countries, sometimes we speak about forecasts, what may happen, scientific predictions of what would, and they always try to bring it back to, to what's happening to facts, to evidence, what's happening to people now. And it's precisely those that are having, as Obi was saying, less contribution to climate crisis, to greenhouse emissions, those that are suffering the impact sooner and in a more ne negative effect. And if we know something, and I'm trying to also learn well, I've been only 15 days in my new position at UNICEF Spain, but it is that the, it is precisely the most vulnerable. So bringing that human impact, we have to say that climate crisis is a child rights crisis too. Uh, children are overly affected by any kind of major climate or environmental hazards, shocks, stresses, um, so coastal flooding, river flooding, uh, cyclones, lead pollution, heat, wa heat waves, water scarcity, and almost every child is affected by one. But we, if we go to, to the most vulnerable, we have uh, more than 300 million children that are ex exposed to at least five of these so, o overlapping. So really, climate crisis is a big uh, childhood crisis and child rights crisis as such. And it speaks about what they also want and what they tell us, so what is UNICEF calling because of what we listen to youth activists and uh, children speaking about boys and girls speaking about climate change. And they, they basically uh, emphasize the three big things, reduce greenhouse gas, gas emissions, increase investment mainly in climate adaptation and resilience and youth part participation. So let's go to the three of them, but through those lens of inequality, as I was, as I was saying. And the first is emissions. So what is the global uh, source of emissions and how it will change as far as we know now? And I'm sharing a couple of, of uh, charts and tables from um, figures from a report that was commissioned by Oxfam very recently for COP26 to the Institute of, uh, for European Environmental Policy and the Stockholm Environment Institute. I think it's a brilliant, uh, that I really recommend you, all those that are here, here in this panel to go through it because it shows the, that uh, economic system and inequality and fairness in terms of, uh, of emissions, mainly we know definitely in terms of impact. So uh, they, they, they use current national determinate uh, contributions, the, the NDCs and other um, forecasts to predict what may, what will happen uh, in terms of what will be changing in terms of the ge geographic source of em emissions in the, coming, in the coming years. And this is what it shows in terms of where are they coming from. So yes, there is a cut in coming from the USA and the EU expected and China and India racing and other, the, the rest of the country is also growing. But let's also have a pointing the 1% richest of the population of the global population that will remain emitting 15, 16%, it will even increase. That said, that picture shows us the trend that is expected. So global north, developed countries reducing the share and uh, global south increasing slightly the, the share. But if we dive a bit deeper on, on this, I mean, we take it more through the, that inequality lens, global e inequality lens, what we see, when we take the black line below as the uh, per capita em em emissions that would be compatible with 1.5 degrees of warming, uh, we see that the global average in the right um, from 1990 to expected to 2030, almost double what uh, should be if we want to remain below 1.5. But if we split this into uh, the 1% richest, 10%, middle 40 and poorest 15, 50%, we see huge differences. And we see that the richest 1% will even be growing from 1990 to 2030, uh, 25 per, per percent, as will remain having uh, 30 times higher their per capita level of emissions to that compatible with 1.5. This remains 
uh, with a 10% richest at 10 times higher. And if we go to the poorest and the majority of people living in Africa and a big percentage of those living in Latin America will be, will be there, uh, is, is still will be far below that per capita, that, that per, per capita. This speaks about global economic system, production system and consumption system. And where, uh, the, where is it coming from, this, this global warming? Um, who is cutting or who would be cutting if we see that forecasts in terms of N, of N, of N disease? We see in the yellow line, those that grew were the, the, the middle classes between 1990 and 2015, global middle, middle classes. While probably the deepest cut, cuts uh, are, are going to come from lower income citizens in high income countries. So this speaks also about the idea of fair tra transitions and potential pu pushbacks coming from the population in high income countries that will be most affected by the political action that will have to be taken to cut, to cut, to cut emissions. And we know this, this is already happening in some countries as France and others I see also in my own Spain. So uh, th that while again, the richest 10% and 1% per percent in the red line remain almost at the same level. Finally, if we go more to the domestic, and that's the final one I will show on, on this inequality. So uh, em emissions and, and domestic in inequality, it shows also these huge differences. So yes, uh, China or India and also some Latin American countries will be growing, but it will re it will they will be growing in, in terms of their their emissions uh, following the same patterns as the global uh, some developed and global north countries if mm, something is not done in the other side so we see we see uh, China that while the fifty percent poorest will remain below the per capita line for one point five compatible with with one point point five we see the one percent really. Uh, going upwards and very far away from that level. Uh, USA, everyone will be above, but there's still high, big, big differences. And even if they will reduce, as we were seeing in the first chart, still they will remain uh, several times, four times above the 1.5 per capita level. So it's not enough the cuts that are expected there. Same happens, although at the lower level with the European Union and the UK, while India will, as an average, remain below the per capita levels, although again with in inequalities within the the, the uh, groups of of the of the population, this speaks very clearly about what has to change globally uh, between countries, but also na nationally in terms of the production patterns, distribution of wealth, consumption patterns and where to put more emphasis if we want to really tackle emissions. Second point, and I will be shorter on, on the other two, climate fund finance, and I will say climate lending, and adaptation, um, and what's coming also a bit of what's coming out of, of COP26, 20, 20, so the figures are a bit from a couple of years ago. The, the, we, we know that the, the commitment was of 100 billion per year uh, in 2020. And, and uh, this is global figures say that it's an 80 per percent there for the last for the last year. But then if we, I'm, I'm referring now to the right side chart, if we go country by, by country, we see that, that it's different and some countries are uh, above their fair share while others are far be below United States, our, our, our Australia, Canada, or Italy. But if we see it in terms of grants and loans, and let's connect this with the debt crisis that is happening uh, across the world and very much in many developing countries, in low income countries, we see that the, in for many of the contributions, the majority of the funding is coming from uh, loans, is not grants. And this very much speaks about mitigation because the, 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 the majority of the funding goes to mitigation and mitigation funding is basically loans because it can be connected with re repayments while the majority of adaptation, not all of it, go uh, through grants. Uh, so it's only part of it. And if we go, if we dig a bit deeper and Oxfam did a very good research 
two, three years ago, as far as I, as I re, re, remember, of that 80 billion of climate finance, of climate funding, uh, it's not really there, but uh, it's only a 20% to, to adaptation. It's a very high part of it, it's lending, but also a, a big part of it is repackaging of old com commitments, of aid co commitments. So I think it was, let me check it, it was a 20% per, per of really net new funding coming through climate finance and through commitments. That said, in the COP26, there have been many different funds and commitments from countries, several entry points, very difficult to monitor where this is coming from. That's a huge task for academics and centers as yours, Harry, uh, but and it's, it has to, has to be done. But as far as we have, have been able to, to tackle, this is what it shows far away from the commitments. And adaptation lagging, lagging be, behind in that 20 per, percent that again would have to be crossed with what is really new net and what is repackaging of old com co commitments. Let me say a final word on finance, on loss and damage, what they put very much connected with climate justice. It is, it is important, I think, I hope everyone knows, but in case don't loss and and damage basically re refer, I'm, I'm showing some, some examples there, but it basically re refers to irreversible uh, harm being done by climate change in communities and in many other places. So you, there are many places where you still can adapt, so you have to put funding for adaptation, but there are others where you can't, uh, it is lost. So uh, it is, that's what I say, it's the main issue of climate justice because you have to, to repair, it's repairing justice of the harm that has been done for those co co com com communities and those people to live in any, any other places and to be able to uh, start a new, a new life in, in, a different, in a different place. Loss and damage has been extremely difficult to, to pass through. I mean, it has somehow re re returned uh, there has been a comeback in COP26. Apparently, there was going to come actually 14 points out of 97 of the of, of the declaration I speak about climate change. But it's very difficult for developed countries to accept the liabilities. That, as Obi was saying, developed countries we have been the main contributors, majority of the contributions to uh, emissions and to global warming. So we have to contribute and to and to repair uh, also through the way through the means of of funding, but there remains blocks. I mean, the issue is, has been back. It's back, hopefully, for COP27 in Egypt. It will be uh, a place to agree on new facilities and new funding, but it's still, uh, although for, for 14 points, the big issue of institutionalization of, of loss and damage and a new facility with funds for it has been blocked by by develop uh, by developed countries so let's see what happens in 27 but it's a extremely important issue to to, to follow through and i'm following the the words of, of one young activist coming from the mal maldives that i was listening to and explaining what means uh, losing your territory and your land and really explains very well speaks really well about what loss and that much means. And so coming from here to, the, to, my, final, to my final point, what means all this? Who is in, influencing uh, climate change processes? What is, the, what is the scope? What is the place given to, to community groups, to, to indigenous peoples, to, to women rights or, or organizations, to youth act, activists, both locally and, and and also globally. So locally, we are still seeing activists and, and leaders and land rights de defenders that are being threatened, that are even being killed. Uh, the civic space that is being closed in so many in, in, in so many countries. So it's really challenging. While also see globally, and we've seen it in COP26, that the in inclusion of in the negotiations have, has not been uh, precisely at, the be at, the, at its best. And it's extremely important that we bring, generally speaking, civil society into the, nego the negotiations, but very specifically youth activists, their voices have to be 
occur the, the role of watchdog of watchdog uh, the transparency of the processes bringing their proposals and their ideas specific to issues like carbon markets that will have a huge impact on so many communities and they are being underrepresented while we see that others are not that underrepresented that shows how many uh, delegates associated with fossil fuel in industries were at the COP 2026, 20, and I don't think I have to comment about that. Young people uh, uh, is not only the future, it's the present, and they want to sit and have a voice and being heard, and uh, significantly heard and meaningfully heard. Thanks, Eric. I will stop there. Thanks so much, Gemma. I think um, you know, a couple of very, again, very important points also coming from you intervention here, the centrality of inequality as a lens to better understand what people in the abstract refer to as, as climate crisis, including the crisis of, of financing, as I think you you very well showed. And, and I like you, I remember that excellent Oxfam report, report actually, which questioned the OECD numbers uh, that are rather, rather generously indeed um, point to current commitments of around 88 billion US dollars annually. Uh, whilst in reality, a lot of this money is not new, it's not additional, and in many cases, not even climate related. It's, it's generally environmental or social, but not specific to climate. So I think it's great that you that you drew attention to that. And of course, to the question of participation. So often discussions about finance, indeed about climate, um, are held in fairly small circles uh, by the usual suspects, as opposed to actually embracing the potential uh, of democratizing these spaces. So I think that was also majorly useful in, in, in what you said. Now I want to turn to our last our last panelist here, uh, last but not least, I should say, uh, Nicolas Lepolis, who is from Brazil, but is based at the University of Oxford, where he's finishing his doctoral work. But alongside his doctoral work, he also serves, if I'm not mistaken, as the fellow at the Oxford Martin School, working on international capital mobility. Uh, also been longtime affiliate of the Center of Studies of African Economies at Oxford and I have the privilege that he's also my co-convener of the Oxford University China African Network. So Nicholas, I think is gonna bring in some of the China angle in our conversations about financing for sustainable development in the Latin American context and in the African context. Uh, Nicholas, thank you very much. The floor is all yours. Thanks, Harry. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to share the floor with such illustrious speakers. Uh, let's not forget about the, the keynote event that we had this morning where Dr. Luis Felipe Lopez Calva had a conversation with Harry and Mauricio Cardenas. Uh, I'm going to be picking up uh, on many of the points that were made uh, throughout this today, this panel and the earlier one, uh, but I'm going to be focusing more narrowly on the question of the, on the mechanics of uh, Chinese uh, financing of renewable energy uh, development and infrastructure in Africa and Latin America. So this is what I'm going to do. This is the plan of my presentation. Uh, briefly uh, highlight, uh, you know, cite what, what are the events, what, where we're at right now. Uh, then uh, think about, provide a, a, very, a very simple framework for thinking about the financing of sustainable development and the different elements, the different chains uh, of, the, of the mechanisms that lead to, to the outcomes we're looking for. Uh, then uh, perhaps the third part is the one I'd like to focus on uh, and digging in, in greater depth at the drivers of productive investment. Uh, you know, uh, both uh, OB and Chema uh, spoke very well about the kind of the international factors driving the financing of sustainable investment. But this is perhaps one, the internal dimension is one I want to focus on, especially the role of China, uh, and then with uh, some conclusions. So where we are right now. Uh, you know, in this map, you can so here's a map of uh, electricity access in Africa, Latin America. Uh, as you can see, we're comparing both regions, but they're not the same, right? So in Latin America, luckily, we've been able to reach almost 100% of electricity access, even though it you know, measured a very low threshold, uh, with some uh, partial exceptions in countries like Haiti or some others in, in, in Central America, such as Nicaragua. But basically, uh, in Latin America, there's a story of sustained progress, which is not so much the case in Africa, right? And you can see that in most of Africa, access, electricity access is still lagging very much. And energy poverty is a very real issue, as uh, Obi uh, mentioned, uh, argued very forcefully. Um, you know, nevertheless, uh, Latin America still has a long way to go. Uh, we can, as I said, this is a low threshold that measures electri electricity access and renewable energy. The progress has been made, uh, but not as strong, not as fast uh, as needed, as desired uh, in, the, in, the, in the lofty goals 
of many uh, Latin American governments, right? Um, and in both regions, there's a persistent proper, uh, problem of poverty. Again, uh, the, pover the problem is deeper in Africa uh, than in Latin America, but in Latin America, as, as was discussed this morning, it's a middle income region, but with uh, extremely high inequality and a lot of poverty still. And this, the amount of poor people in Latin America have increased uh, in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic, which hit it particularly hard. So poverty and energy poverty, very real issues into the two regions and uh, one that has to be dealt with uh, in, in, the, in the, under the imperative of uh, you know, advancing in energy transitions. Um, in addition to these very real needs, we also have uh, financing. Financing is an issue in both regions, right? In Africa, uh, we currently have eight countries considered in debt distress, 12 at high risk of that, that distress. Uh, in, in earlier events with OCAN, uh, we have a, I had the pleasure of convening with Harry, we discussed how the debt service suspension initiative and the common framework for debt treatments have been proposed as solutions for dealing with Afri African debt problems, but this is still ongoing. Um, in the African context, we often speak about the infrastructure finance gap, uh, which is variously calculated, uh, depends on the methodology, of course, but often at hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And this was prior uh, to, to the COVID pandemic. Uh, and now, you know, in view of the crisis called by COVID, uh, many of these problems have been aggravated and could imperil uh, the progress limited. Uh, from modest pace, but the progress that there has been in Africa in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, advancing towards the development of renewable energy. As you can see from this chart, which shows uh, public, uh, international public financial flows, right? Uh, in, uh, in Latin America, the situation uh, is, is similar with regards to the fiscal, to the deterioration of the fiscal outlook uh, that it has suffered from. Uh, as I said, Latin America has been hit particularly hard from the COVID pandemic for reasons that are not yet very clear, as, uh, as Dr. Lopez Calva told us uh, earlier uh, today. And in, in, the, in the aftermath of the pandemic, rising public spending commitments, the reduction in the tax base, of course, due to the economic crisis, has led to deterioration of the fiscal outlook, rising debt levels, uh, leading Latin America to be the most indebted developing region, uh, high debt to export ratios. And again, imperiling uh, the, the mission of transitioning towards a greater uh, renewable mix in its energy in the matrix, uh, which, uh, well, we can argue of how these risks should be allocated at a global level, but you know, most people would agree that it's very necessary uh, in order to, to address climate change uh, in the continent. So financing is a central component, uh, it's a central issue here, uh, and China uh, has an important role to play in financing uh, renewable, uh, sustainable development in both regions, right? So here I'm um, in, you know, focusing on what China's record is so far. And we can see that China has been a substantial provider of finance to both regions. Uh, as of 2019, uh, the data that we've, that we've managed to find in previous research shows that around $78 billion were owed uh, by Ch African governments uh, to China in 2019. Um, you know, outstanding loans, not total disbursement, but outstanding loans. Uh, many of these, uh, these loans were used to finance very important projects and in infrastructure, industrializations, as Obi mentioned, very important uh, areas that African governments have to work on. Um, but it is true that in many cases, the African countries have struggled to repay loans uh, for Chinese projects. Uh, and arguably, it is a contributor to current debt, debt distress in Africa, not the main uh, contributor, but an, a contributor, and in some countries, a more important contributor than in others. Uh, and so this is, you know, it has an important fiscal dimension. In Latin America, there are fewer, uh, the latest data show fewer outstanding loans than in Africa in absolute terms, uh, which also means much, much fewer in relative terms, given the larger size uh, of Latin American economies. Right. Um, nonetheless, there, there are some, some, you know, some regional, intra-regional differentiation in cases such as Venezuela and Ecuador are relatively more exposed to Chinese finance. Uh, but again, some have argued that even in other countries, it has contributed uh, to a deterioration of fiscal outlook. Maybe it has lessened uh, the, the discipline provided by market finance. I'm not going to get into this, but China is an important financier in Latin America, too. And uh, China has played an important role in both regions in financing energy investment, right? Uh, China is, is a leader across 
you know, energy sources, all energy sources, of course, uh, you know, and oil is a, is a big, uh, you know, produce a lot of energy from oil, from coal, uh, the biggest uh, producer of hydropower in the world, but also a leader uh, in renewables and solar, wind. Um, however, this, this prowess, this energy prowess uh, that China has, has not necessarily uh, be translated into Chinese energy projects overseas, right? And so what the data shows is that in, in Africa, gas projects are predominant, but also very important hydropower projects in Africa, as, as uh, Harry has, has researched on profusively uh, in the past. Uh, in Latin America is also an important financier of hydropower, to some extent of wind in both regions. Uh, solar energy seems to be particularly lagging, given uh, China's global leadership in solar energy technologies. This has not been shown uh, in China's overseas activities. And, uh, and this has led some you know, current research to, to, to question the, the reason behind this. Why is it that China has not been able to deliver uh, in terms of renewable energies in its activities in Africa and Latin America? And what current research uh, suggests is that it's a combination of factors, right? Uh, firstly, uh, the profile of energy projects uh, is different. Uh, than that from the large projects such as hydropower or coal mining, etc. Um, and so that makes it harder uh, in terms of uh, perceived, you know, prospective returns uh, for Chinese uh, developed policy banks, the China Exim Bank, the China Development Bank, etc. Uh, the solar, uh, the renewable energy business model is also appears to be different uh, and more difficult to deal with. Uh, in China itself, there have been difficulties in, in, in instituting, in, 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 in delivering uh, the renewable energies. And there's a perception of the Chinese side that the difficult business environments of Africa and Latin America, uh, in many cases, might be completely inimical to uh, implementing uh, these, these technologies there, right? There's also the fact of lacking, in many cases, lacking political will, both on the Chinese side and on African and Latin American side, of pushing these, these projects forward. Maybe renewable energy is not a priority. Um, and then uh, this is a, perhaps the last point is the one I want to focus on. And it's a lack of bankability, right? The idea that there is not uh, adequate collect collateral, that uh, the institutional system is unstable and that conditions are not favorable in general uh, to, uh, to developing bankable projects, right? So here I mentioned uh, the poor institutional environment and, and low economic returns. We can break down the problem in many ways, uh, but these are the aspects I think that are very important uh, to hold in mind. Um, and so this leads to the question, sorry, this leads to the question, how can China's pros in financing sustainable development be productively deployed in relations with African Latin America? That is a million dollar question. That is the SDG question uh, we're dealing with here, uh, but also dealing with uh, in the, the other conversations that will be part of this series. Um, here, I'm just providing a very uh, simple framework for us to think about the problem, uh, you know, external financing, internal financing, the efficiency of public investment, and then the returns uh, you get from that investment. Again, these are issues that were raised uh, by the previous speakers today. They were also raised uh, by Dr. Lopez Calva uh, earlier today. Uh, nothing new here, but let's, let's see how these, uh, how these factors apply uh, to the case of Chinese uh, financing to uh, renewable energy in Africa and Latin America, right? So briefly on external financing, uh, you know, I have some, some cartoons here, but the point I'm trying to make uh, is that uh, in Latin America, in, up to now, the Chinese presence uh, has been mostly, uh, we can think about the external financing dimensions and, 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 and how China fits into that. The Chinese presence has mostly been at least, uh, you know, vulgarly, in terms of uh, money, economic, right? The purely commercial presence. That's a kind of the interpretation that a lot of people have been given and that perhaps I'd be changing. Uh, Latin America has been a source of commodities for China's growth. Uh, and we saw this morning how uh, the trade profile of many uh, Latin American economies has changed over time from, from the US being the first, uh, the primary uh, trade partner shifting over time towards China, especially countries in the, in the Southern part of South America, right? Brazil, the Southern Cone, uh, uh, Peru. Um, and, and, and so trade has been the primary means of engagement between China uh, and Latin America, right? And so this, you know, this question is, is it all about the money? Um, but uh, there's also increasing amounts of Chinese finance uh, in, in, in the continent. 
uh, arguably China Chinese finance comes with some advantages such as longer time horizons you know especially Chinese financing that is facilitated by Chinese policy banks uh, have been uh, deployed in, in many uh, parts of Latin America both from national states uh, corporates and also subnationals um, the, the the fact is that the the way the Chinese financing be behaves in each context varies. And so I think this is one important factor to keep in mind is that in general, Chinese financing is uh, differentiated. You have a multitude of actors, right? You have the state-owned banks, uh, you have uh, the, you know, the policy banks, you have the Chinese commercial banks, but also uh, what, what research, existing research finds is that according to the entity to which uh, fine, uh, Chinese entities uh, provide finance to, uh, their impacts might be difficult, different, right? And uh, the most important distinction perhaps here is uh, between these commodity producing uh, states, uh, particularly ones where there has been uh, institutional deterioration in recent years. Uh, you know, Venezuela comes as, as number one, uh, but you know, there's been a lot of ch uh, Chinese commodity backed loans also to countries such as Ecuador. In these cases, uh, Chinese loans have come with additional opaqueness. Uh, while, uh, you know, research finds that loans to corporates or subnationals might behave more like traditional market uh, mechanisms. Uh, and so in a way uh, might, might, be, might resemble other types of finance coming from, from North America or Europe, right? It is also important to remember though that Chinese finance has evolved over time. Uh, and, and as China has again, increasing experience uh, in other parts of the developing world, uh, these mechanisms and these modalities have been uh, evolving. I won't get into depth into that, uh, but these are, these are important points to keep in mind. Uh, in contrast to, to the very commercial, uh, or at least the way it has been interpreted, uh, and maybe these dynamics have been, has changed uh, with COVID and uh, the incidence of, of vaccine diplomacy, but uh, compared to Latin America, the, the Chinese presence in Africa is much more political in nature. There's a much more important political component to it. So on the one hand, Africa and Latin America resemble each other, as low savings commodity exporting economies in, in, in this phrase that I like very much. So in you know the structural, to use a very Latin American term, the structural insertion uh, in the international economy is very similar. Uh, they're very vulnerable to international developments in capital markets uh, and commodity prices. But uh, in the relationship to China, which again is similar in terms of trade profiles, mostly being has mostly been about commodities, but uh, in the case of Africa, there is additional uh, political component uh, that changes, that brings similarities to the Latin American case, but important differences, right? So uh, in Africa, uh, while in Latin America, you have an important role for, for corporates and subnational entities uh, in intermediating Chinese finance, in Africa, it's mostly about national states, uh, state to state, sovereign to sovereign. Um, and so uh, again, with this longer history of political ties going, you know, all the way back to liberation movements, uh, something that Harry has has, uh, has written about. Um, the the relationships is the relationship is somewhat more intimate uh, and, and and more encompassing. And as you can see here in the picture that we have, uh, you know, we had this is a picture from the FOCAC, the Forum of China Africa Corporation, from from the, the previous one that happened in 2018 in, in China. Uh, you know, China has the ability to bring together all African heads of state. And it's not necessarily a matter of uh, supporting uh, authoritarian regimes, uh, as, you know, infamously did in, in kind of rogue states such as Sudan and Zimbabwe. But uh, China does have strong political relations with a broad sweat of, of African states, right? And what this means is that Chinese financing uh, has kind of uh, the potential, so what I call an encompassing logical accumulation, again, drawing on a, on a phrase from, from previous research, um, has a more, because of the important relational component to it, has more of a greater leeway is given to the recipient state to mold uh, Chinese finance according to its own uh, priorities. Okay, so these are some of the, uh, briefly touching on uh, the, the external, so going back here, I briefly touched on the external component, I won't go into the internal component for the moment, but now let's look at uh, investment efficiency. So, you know, we have finance is provided uh, according to different modalities, but how do governments translate this financing into productive investment? And here I'm, I'm going to draw some of the research uh, that we've done at Oxford, uh, particularly looking at the cases of Kenya and, uh, and Ethiopia, uh, a project we did when we looked at the challenges to infrastructure that development. 
Um, and what we find is that even when financing is available, uh, a lot of African countries, and again, this is returning to a theme that was alluded to in previous conversations, right? The governance, uh, and again, Obi and uh, Dr. Luis Felipe mentioned uh, this morning, the importance of governance. Uh, and in, what it, we find in many African countries is that the policymaking environment is often fragmented and there's poor institutionalization, right? So bureaucratic uh, capacity uh, is, not, is not very high. Uh, this is not just a matter of technical capacity though, but to large extent derived from political conditions on the continent. Again, this varies a lot uh, according to the African country. In some countries, you have kind of more coherent uh, form of policy making, uh, but in others, uh, political authority is very much fragmented and you have different interest groups uh, competing for power. And that means that kind of bureaucratic rationality and bureaucratic processes are not that important in policy making, right? And here we have a, a chart. This is from our work uh, we did, uh, the research we did, um, and that draws on, on uh, that looks at the road building in Kenya. Uh, and what we found is that the, the, there's a many over many authorities. It's a very fragmented policymaking environment with many authorities with overlapping mandates. And this creates a lot of confusion. And what we found is that the road sector, uh, there's, it lacks coordination. The investments that were made lack the coordination, which is essential right, uh, in order to, to, to use a very economic language to internalize the network externalities from infrastructure investment. Uh, again, um, you know, uh, one, one solution that's often been found to the problem of political power in Africa has been decentralization, but what we found in Kenyan case and, and surely has analogs, uh, let's say, you know, we can raise this with Obi, in the case of Nigeria or other countries that are decentralized or federations, uh, they're often, this results in a mismatch between the responsibilities given to the different levels of government uh, and the financial resources they have access to, especially in Africa, where so much of financing is still concentrated uh, in, the, in the central state. These problems are not unique uh, to Africa, of course. And here I'm drawing uh, from some, uh, you know, from my knowledge of my native country of Brazil, but we can also extend many of these ideas to other parts of Latin America. Uh, Brazil, as, as other countries in Latin America, such as Argentina, Mexico, and Venezuela, is a federation. Right, and the challenge of uh, horizontal vertical coordination between different levels of government is uh, very important and adds a lot of complexity to policy making. Also, the continued role of public banks, state-owned enterprises, uh, and other uh, public entities uh, further complicates horizontal coordination. Right, and so it's hard uh, to create uh, uh, you know juridical security to create a simple institutional environment to facilitate infrastructure investments. Plus we have other obstacles such as high tax burdens, cost of bureaucracy, which are very well known for people who work in Brazil. Um, and here the parallel with Africa is interesting, right? Because even though the political systems and you know, the level of institutional development are, are very different from, from African countries, we still have the problem of political fragmentation, right? And you know, Brazil is famously the most fragmented uh, Congress, a legislature in the world has, has famously been. Uh, we also have a problem of political fragmentation, of course, in many other Latin American countries, uh, or increasing fragmentation. Peru is a case in point, of course, but others increasingly uh, following the road. And what that means is that it's very hard to create an environment that allows infrastructure to be productively deployed to finance, uh, to advance uh, sustainable uh, development. Okay. In the, uh, you know, against this backdrop, what, what are the solutions found by governments uh, to, to address, to, 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 you know, where does all this financing, how is it used, right? What we often see, uh, and again, this is drawing from our research in Africa, is that given the fragmented business environment, what a lot of governments do is they adopt top-down centralized policy interventions that often bypass these institutional constraints. So here we have pictures of two important projects. So this is the standard gauge railway in, in, in Kenya, which was financed and uh, built uh, by Chinese entities. And here we have Hawassa Industrial Park in Ethiopia, which I, which I know intimately, which was not financed by China, was financed by an euro bond, but was built uh, by a Chinese uh, state-owned enterprise. And in both cases, uh, you know, implementation was expedited uh, because uh, the president of, of Kenya and the prime minister of Ethiopia, they bypass the usual bureaucratic channels to make sure the projects were implemented. So in a way, uh, you know, these mechanisms is good because these mechanisms are good because they allow governments to bypass these problems in institutional environments. But on the other hand, uh, they also open the door uh, to external actors. 
uh, again, China, but also you know, Western export credit agencies, Western donors, et cetera. Uh, so this, is, is, so this uh, you know, increases the influence of external actors because if you're going to bypass your own, your own uh, bureaucratic systems, you need someone to, to, to do the work for you. Uh, and you know, there's a risk of disconnecting with the surrounding institutional environment. So I mentioned uh, the, the example of the light rail transit in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, Hawassa Industrial Park, uh, you know, all projects that were executed uh, that were very important for, for, for the government, for industrialization, infrastructure development, but they lacked coordination. So you know, the light rail transit, it lacked coordination for, with electricity investment. Uh, so in many cases, uh, electricity is not provided in uh, inadequate amounts for, for, for the urban transportation system to work. Uh, we have also examples uh, in terms of housing uh, and, and again in the industrial park with a disconnect with urban planning, which really uh, hits on the, on, the, on the return to these investments, right? Um, and you know, one important point before I, I am I'm moving forward to fast forward to conclusion is that by bypassing the, the institutional systems in place, uh, these mechanisms undermine the further undermine the institutional environment by emasculating uh, the bureaucracy. Um, China's role here uh, can be positive and can be negative, right? So China is the financier of choice for a lot of these projects because of financial resources, the, the speed with which it can disperse and the construction efficiency. Uh, however, a lot of mechanisms in China, I can get into depth in this in the, in the Q&A perhaps, you know, Chinese, uh, what happens is that the, the modality of Chinese finance, often there is a misalignment, that there's a mismatch, mismatch between country needs and the types of infrastructure that is provided. Uh, and again, it undermines coordination and emasculates bureaucratic systems. Uh, and, but one important point that perhaps I want to highlight is that it not only has institutional effects, but it also has a political effects, right? And by empowering the executive, who's also often the recipient of Chinese finance and finance funds, uh, we, we so-called sovereignty rents, so the fact that, uh, you know, the person occupying the pallets, given China's uh, doctrine of non-interference, is the one who receives these funds, it also has important uh, effects on domestic politics in these countries. And this is, this is something that we must consider also as part of the sustainable development agenda. So just to conclude, uh, you know, China's uh, financing has mixed effects on developing countries. Uh, to a large extent, this is a product of the externalization of China's development model which both included in impressive infrastructure development and progress on renewables, but also not very good governance, poor governance, right? Lack of transparency. So these are, you know, these, these, these facets of China's development model are also translated in. Uh, again, Chinese financing is variable uh, and subject to what states make of it. Uh, however, uh, for renewable energy, for the renewable energy and in the economic diversification agendas, to advance, we, it's very important. And this is the point that Mauricio made earlier today, the importance of transparency of good governance will be important in, 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 the, in these areas. Uh, and just to conclude, you know, we can also think, given that uh, a lot of these insights build on Africa, uh, we also have to, this also give us room to think about the implications for Latin America, right? How does China's role in the institutional environment in, Africa, in Latin America, which is only growing, how this affects the politics and political economy? Uh, in Latin America, and how does this also affect uh, the offerings of Western governments and multilaterals uh, when they try to compete uh, with China uh, in the developing world to find uh, sustainable development? Thank you very much. I'll stop here. Uh, the floor. Thank you, Harry. Thank you so much, Nicholas. That was that was excellent, and and providing some some outstanding, I think, evidence as well as a very good framework for people to to think about in a more structured way in a conversation that's often. I guess, held in, in, in terms of slogans, rallying cries, depending on one's politics. I think, you know, trying to drill down as you did um, and actually trying to show empirically can be understood, I think is extremely useful. May I ask uh, Chiman and Obi too to put your cameras on and, and join me here for the, for the conversation uh, on the podium, the virtual podium, <laughs> as, as if it were. Uh, we've got a number of questions in the q and I've got a number of personal questions, but I have a first question. Uh, we'll go to you, Obi. Um, one of the things you were highlighting as you were speaking about the double problems of, of climate, the framing of climate and debt, was the need to crowd in the private sector, uh, that one of the key participants, both in process of debt restructuring, but also in process of mitigation and perhaps above all, adaptation must be the private sector. 
Uh, question that will go to you, therefore, is how do we do that? What kind of mechanisms are appropriate for that? Um, you know, there's a lot of resistance uh, around that for a whole variety of reasons, some of those more convincing than others. Uh, perhaps some of your thoughts uh, on that would be would be very welcome to, to kick us off. Yeah, so um, I think that a key part of that process would begin with, in fact, just building a, bis a business uh, model around uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, issues that address climate change, uh, issues that promote decarbonization. Uh, not sufficient enough investment has gone into that. Uh, just simply uh, being able to take each of the sectors, what we currently do when we have this conversation is to take sectors and just uh, focus on sectors. And so it's a disjointed conversation. If we could have a conversation that is tying in an integrated way uh, to the kind of economic growth that, that is uh, unleashed uh, uh, through uh, climate resilient uh, uh, kind of uh, approaches uh, for uh, development uh, in, in, in the, on the continent, it would support a better way of um, uh, analytical identification of where the opportunities exist for uh, pricing models uh, that, that drive the incentive for private sector to come to the table for that conversation. Um, a corollary to this is of course that, you know, we do need to identify specific projects. Uh, we do need uh, the, the kinds of uh, uh, projects that are, that are transformative uh, in nature, the projects that would uh, make a lot of sense in terms of um, identifying uh, not just the risks, but also the premium that go with those risks. Uh, and I think that um, we're falling short in that. You cannot really uh, uh, put on the table a significant portfolio of such projects uh, that have been uh, designed and uh, are awaiting that kind of financing. So we cannot speak about private sector participation in the flux. You can, we, can't, we can't talk about it as merely something that is desirable. There has to be some tangibility uh, to that conversation. Uh, and then the third part of it is that the driver of this conversation ultimately has to be the governments. Uh, the governments, uh, hold the key uh, to inviting other participants to solving uh, public problems. Uh, the, the, the effect of climate change on, on society is a public problem. And so it is government that solves public problems. The only thing that we identify clearly is that the fiscal space for government to solve the climate change issue alone is very thin. Therefore, government must play the very important, uh, uh, you know, enabler role, a uh, coordinator role, uh, and governments in Africa have to have the expertise to understand which stakeholder is important for what conversation. Uh, those kinds of stakeholder analytics uh, are still missing in national programs uh, for climate change, uh, you know, as part of the uh, in, uh, as, part, as an integrated part of the economic vision of a number of the countries. So this is some, so this is a, 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 a problem that would need to be fixed. And then the final point is that when you look at global capital and, and the way that it, it naturally selects environments that it goes to, the truth is that the business environment on our continent would need to even improve more. Uh, you know, the fact that uh, money is not pouring in into sectors sans climate change effect, uh, it gives us a sense that with climate change effect, uh, there would even be a, a higher barrier to, to cross, right? A higher hurdle uh, to cross, which means that it is, uh, which therefore makes it imperative for our continent to do much more in removing the barriers to private capital, uh, you know, uh, as fast as we can. And that goes back again to uh, the issue of quality of governance, the soundness of policies, the, the, the kind of institutional capacity that we, uh, we, we're, we're showing, uh, the kind of priorities of, of investment through our own 
self-generated resources, what are the priorities we're investing in? They are signals. Uh, you know, if we're investing in certain sectors, the signal to the private sector where our priorities lie. And if those sectors are critical sectors that enable, uh, that support the unleashing, the unlocking of growth prospects, on, uh, and then they, they are even more attractive to the private sector. So the selection of, 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 of investment by government is also something that would signal to private sector our readiness to uh, work together collaboratively with private sector to use uh, collective resources to solve these problems. Absolutely, Obi. Thank you. Thank you for those those reflections. Now, uh, Chima, I wanted to ask you also one question that was also submitted to me uh, in the chat by by Mark. It reflects a bit on on perhaps uh, something that Obi said as well. Um, you know, what, what's your sense in your experience um, as to how useful a, at least allowing this certain developing countries to continue to invest in hydrocarbons would be? And I think the question was trying to get at the tension between these kind of big mega projects, which, you know, oil and gas usually are, dams as well, very capital intensive, vis-a-vis um, -vis smaller scale projects. Can smaller scale projects ever really get to grips with the magnitude of the energy poverty? Um, is there no other alternative but this? Um, what, what's your sense about, about this discussion between the and, and the importance of the scale of projects and therefore also the involvement of people in those in those projects? Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Harry. I'm not going to to bring any any data on on these that I haven't got recently. So yes, more coming from my from my experience, but also from what I see and I read and some data that I have in in my own country and in other uh, global north countries where we've been. Uh, and I know, and I think it is impossible to tackle the energy tra transition without a small scale, a small scale projects. And speaking from, from Spain, one of the of the blocking of the block, the blocking of the of the small scale projects, even the self-consumption project projects in, in your own your own houses in your own small land in the rural areas re, re, was a, a, a block and, and derailed the full energy tra transition by by several by several years so speaking about Latin America or Africa I think we have very good very good examples on on the need to invest more and not only to invest more but to re release the potential that a small scale projects has in renewable energies across ter ter territories. It has also, um, it's far better in, in terms of, of community impact. I mean, it is more, com are more community controlled projects in that sense, even if they are not owned by uh, us, while we, we still know that big, that big projects, although all the safeguards and policies that big institutions and companies, et cetera, et cetera, on the guidelines, we still know that, uh, it, that they do have uh, an impact, a big negative potential impact in, in, in communities. And still, this is happening and it's difficult to, to challenge them. That said, yes. Uh, Probably it is impossible to to develop what is the growth uh, potential in terms of industry and the and the overall economy of of a, of a country without bigger projects. But let's let's go for for them. But let's go in, in a different way as we have done in developed countries for for many years. And trade offs will have to be faced. Uh -huh. We are already facing them also in in every country. There is a trade off now between land for solar or wind energy and land for agriculture and food. And uh, yeah, and we have to learn what we have learned about speaking with communities and facing trade-offs between apparently conflicting interests that have to be uh, reconciled and, and they should be. Harry, may I say something to that? Absolutely. Because I, I, of, I often see uh, this conversation becoming a zero-sum game uh, sometimes where people uh, sort of uh, uh, suggest for uh, a continent uh, the adoption of uh, small-scale uh, solutions. 
And you know that clearly that there is no way that that can power the kind of growth that uh, is necessary. Um, I think that, you know, to the extent that we want to keep this conversation real, we should constantly be guided by, by data. We should con constantly be evidence informed. And I find that it is in the climate change discussion that people can, so can determine what aspect of statistic they want to use to make a case for themselves. And that is a, a problem for you know, really making progress on this. I think it is very clear that for our continent, uh, it, the, the, the transitioning process has to be taken with a sense that as the, geo, geo, the, the, um, the, polit the economic centers of production around the world begin to deconstruct, uh, you know, I mean, climate change, as, uh, sorry, uh, the um, pandemic showed us how important it is for us not to have a monopoly production system in our world. Uh, we all were waiting for just one country in the world for just common PP, yeah, PPEs. Uh, why, why should that be so? It means that decentralization of production systems is important. Africa is a place where only just about 2% of global manufacturing uh, value added is, is, is being contributed uh, from. And so it means that this is a place where we should think of these kinds of mega projects that are based on investment in the right kinds of technologies that would support the global agenda. You know, in a, in a way, what is standing uh, um, against the progress that should be made on this is self-defeating self nationalism that is entering into uh, the, the, the leadership of this conversation by the advanced economies. Uh, so so the, 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 the entrenched inequalities that exist today seem to want to even widen more uh, on the back of the climate change. And that should not be the case. If we are going to look at a future where global growth is, is guaranteed, uh, where global growth is based on uh, the fact that all, uh, all, all pillars of growth should continue to grow, then it must be based on an understanding that the science and the data uh, will argue for a transitioning by Africa in a way that does not compromise its development uh, objectives. Well, 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 well taken, Obi. I think, you know, as you said, important reminder again of what is what is left out in those kind of those kind of arguments. Uh, Nicholas, there's a couple of questions um, in the Q and A which you may also have seen by Anis about you know your, your institutional framework, the risks of regulatory capture. I also see questions by Rogare about the issue of bypassing to speed up project funding and implementation. Could you speak to some of these these questions? I mean, this kind of institutional nitty gritty that you drew our attention to is very important to go from mobilizing capital, whether internal or, or external, and actually uh, resulting in the kind of outcomes we want to see. Um, could you address some of those? I, th I think you know, people are very keen to hear more from you on, on, on those kind of matters. Yes, yes. Uh, thanks. These are great questions. Uh, and of course, regulatory capture is, is always a risk in any government, not only in Africa, Latin America, but also in Europe, uh, United States. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in the cases that we're looking at, in terms of solutions, I think we need to, we can think about the external, and the internal dimensions. Externally, surely external partners, uh, as they've been doing, they should push for greater transparency, of course, transparency is an important component of democracy. But uh, it's also important that this transparency is not used merely as kind of a geopolitical weapon. And it, as it can often be the case, the, the demands for transparency are merely just a pre pretext for, for China bashing, really, right? And it is true that China is lacking in transparency, and that is something that should by all means be addressed. But uh, it would be a shame if the potential that China has to, 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 to promote sustainable development in Africa and Latin America and elsewhere were blocked just in account of, of uh, you know, this transparency uh, issue. And that is why it's important to really come to terms with the way that Chinese financing works and the fact that in this very competitive uh, financing model, uh, you know, the fact that uh, often uh, people, officials of policy banks have personal liability for the projects they have. And, you know, the, the way the, the Chinese financing works is different from the way 
uh, uh, Western countries' financing works, and it, to, it might be very hard for them at times to uh, to uh, you know introduce transparency in the same way that we see in Western countries. And so it is a tri tight uh, balancing act, I think, on the external dimension, kind of promoting transparency but without completely denying the the the, the, the potential of, of Chinese finance. Right on the internal dimension, I think this is a point that makes that made very strongly by Chema, but also made important by Harry. Well, democracy, right? How to keep governments accountable well, by, by furthering democracy and, and furthering popular control over, over politicians' decisions. And, it, and I think that is the main remedy towards regulatory capture at the end of the day, right? You can have as strong institutions as you have, but if uh, the public is not ready, it doesn't have the tools to intervene, uh, then you're always at the risk of, of a regulatory capture. So definitely furthering democracy, but also kind of the reforms to strengthen the institutional environment. Uh, Etc. So, you know, external dimensions, internal dimensions, uh, you know, but thinking about the details of how to, to further transparency to avoid uh, regulatory capture. Um, in terms of bypass, should I go to the question of bypassing? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the issue of bypassing, you know, it's a double edged sword, right? Because if you have an institutional obstacle, uh, then so sometimes rather than trying to reform the whole state, uh, countries. Uh, you know, erect kind of alternative institutions, so-called bureaucratic enclaves, right? Islands of excellence. And these can often be very productive to, to deliver development. And, you know, many people would argue that the Ethiopian experience in past decades, well, uh, you know, despite what's, what's happened recently, of course, the tragedy, tragedy happening there now. But the, prior to that, you know, Ethiopia was, was treated as a country in Africa that was able to very productively uh, deploy this kind of these top-down mechanisms to advance important development projects. You know, these comes with these comes with problems, though, right? Because at some point, if you don't institutionalize policymaking, uh, it's it's hard to 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 go beyond a certain level uh, when you're in certain kinds of industries. But we always talk, spoke about industrialization. Industrialization is harder to achieve if you don't have more coordination. You need different you need different pieces of the puzzle together. To advance, uh, to advance uh, industrialization, uh, you know, Brazil has also been a country that historically has tried to bypass institutional constraints through through, through other institutions such as the National Development Bank, the BNDES, these other elite agencies, and another one that at some point you might hit obstacles that are hard to surpass if you don't really uh, improve uh, the, the the state uh, as a whole. So yeah, double-edged sword. Much, sorry, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to take three final questions here from, from the Q&A. I'm going to pose one to, to each of you, and if you could uh, respond in a minute or two, that would be, that would be, that would be terrific. Um, first question, I think, Nurshim, I want to, I want to ask you about, um, and, uh, you know, get your thoughts on this question there about the importance of gender in all of this. And it was one of the, um, one of the, one of the audience members' comments that, you know, of course, so much, especially of of the high finance sectors, but also a lot of the national oil companies, energy sectors is often dominated by men as is politics, in many parts of Latin America and Africa. In your experience uh, as Oxfam director, as, as someone who traveled to many of these countries, uh, is there a gender aspect to, to the leadership, to the agency, to the, the degree to which decision makers are, are responsive to some of the, the themes that you're highlighting? So if you could take a minute to, to reflect a bit on, on that, that would be useful. Uh, Nicholas, I see a question for you uh, regarding um, uh, source material and methodologies. That is to say, there's a lot of statistics that are being bandied around about, about China, about financing, about energy. Um, you know, how do you ascertain what is what is quality? What is a value here? Is there anything where you can direct people that you say this is this is good? This is something to be taken with a pinch of salt. I think that would be uh, useful for a number of people. And and finally, uh, Obi, perhaps perhaps to you the, the last question about inclusivity and inclusion, uh, taking the point again that we must increase um, the uh, per capita energy consumption in African countries across the board. Um, but how do we actually ensure that, that you know, there's, there's increases in averages actually benefit ordinary people? As, as you know yourself, there's a number of African energy producers where supply has not been the problem, um, but of course, making sure people benefit from, from that increased supply very much is. So how do you see that, that linkage between increasing and the per capita and the, the, the access on the whole? So let me perhaps start with Chema, then Nicholas, and then, then Obi to, to have the final word. Chema, over to, to you for the question on gender. Yeah, thank you, Harry. And, I will, and, I, and it will be brief to, to, to say that, yes, it is across gender. Gender is across anything re related with climate change and climate crisis. 
it's definitely in the impact. So uh, it's gender unequal. Um, it's uh, it's, it's, it's heaviest, most negative uh, for girls and for women across the world. And we know that, and there's many data about it. It's true, as you say, that it's also in, in, in the leadership side. And I think we, we see leaders, uh, we, we see more, uh, it's not across the board, is that we will always find exceptions to this rule. And we also find it in Europe, but it's not only companies and, and private sector, it's also government leaders who will find more sympathy, more closeness and more boldness in terms of political decisions in uh, women political leaders than what you find, generally speaking, in men. And definitely that speaks also for the private sector, uh, of, of course. But then finally, let's put it in the positive side. What are we seeing in terms of the, of the, of the proposals and what's coming from youth? Again, you will find uh, young men also leading uh, many of, of the demonstrations, but mo some of the most boldest messages and activism and leadership is coming from young women that are facing across the world. I'm following several African, Latin American uh, young leaders and, and you can feel that. And they're bringing this eco-feminism as the kind of, of new models. If we speak about unequal and the need to shift uh, significantly the economic consumption and production models. Eco-feminism -fe speaks a lot about that. Well, well thank you so much for that, for that, Chema. Nicholas? Moving to the more prosaic and boring point <laughs> about data. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, you know, the, the data is a, talking about Africa and Latin America, you know, the, the Africa, the, traditionally the reference point has been the center of, of uh, the China Africa Research Initiative at uh, Johns Hopkins Science Carry. They have uh, kind of the most well-known data set on, on the development, Chinese development finance in Africa. Um, the equivalent for that in the Latin American case has been the work of the Boston Global Development Policy Center, who has a, a series of data sets on energy investment and other types of investment of, by China in Latin America. But there's also a, a alternative data sets that have come out in, in, in recent years, uh, such as the AIDS data, which is very important, which has a series uh, hundreds of Chinese projects across the world and many in detail. Look, they look at contracts in detail, both in terms of uh, debt, uh, but also uh, foreign direct investment. Um, and, but there's, you know, it's difficult to measure uh, the Chinese data, Chinese investment, uh, you know, loans and investment. A lot of these methodologies rely on internet searches, basically. Uh, so a lot of them often is more about loan commitments and you, it's harder to track loan disbursements. They rely on official documentation, it's hard to know, you know, to what extent projects were implemented. Um, we also have some work recent by people like Carmen Reinhardt looking at, you know, Chinese debt, uh, looking uh, other, these and other people look at also from the perspective of, of, of fiscal accounts of, of countries in Africa themselves. Uh, that's also what does um, uh, Stephen Kaplan in his work on Latin America. It looks, he com looks at also documents by Latin American governments. Um, so that is to say, you know, China's opaqueness really makes it hard to measure uh, how much funding has been given to these countries. There are data sets there, but you know, to be taken always with a pinch of salt because of different methodologies, uh, you, know, you should always compare and contrast, uh, but there is a lot of data out there and increasingly so. All right, very useful. I hope for, for our listeners that that was, that was useful. Last but least, Obi, I'll let, give you the floor to, to, to wrap up here with, with your thoughts on this, on this connection between increasing per capita consumption and making sure everybody benefits from it. So, um, you know, the argument for increase in per capita consumption of um, energy by the continent is made. Uh, clearly, when you look at uh, the, the data that stacks up against the continent, how can a continent uh, uh, like Africa, which is, uh, uh, you know, compare it with, uh, say, Canada. Canada is about one thirteenth the population of Africa. Africa's uh, total installed uh, you know, uh, generation capacity is about 123 gigawatts of, 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 of energy. How can it possibly even compete in, 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 in the global economy with that kind of, uh, you know, a, a miserable, uh, uh, you know, access to energy? Uh, so 
clearly all options for generating energy for industrialization must be on the table for Africa. That has to be part of the global conversation. We cannot, on the one hand, probate and then reprobate when we come to the international uh, table of discussions. Uh, we say we want to tackle poverty, but we must keep Africa uh, inevitably poor because of the uh, poor options that it, it's being asked to, uh, to take around um, energy generation. Uh, so what I think is that we do need to uh, nuance the conversation around energy and climate change as it concerns Africa by ensuring that all options are on the table in a way that we can design the right uh, uh, policies and the right regulations and the right incentives that can support uh, investment in new technologies that will support the process of Africa's uh, industrialization. And I'm not saying that this has to be the business of the rest of the world while Africa looks on. I'm simply saying that that conversation has to be a collaborative conversation because what the world world expects Africa to do in terms of uh, the climate, uh, 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 climate, uh, 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 climate response uh, is something that amounts to a public good for the rest of the world. And if it is a public good, it should be properly prized and it should be the basis of a support in the way that generation of energy for development happens for the continent. In terms of ensuring that all options, all energy mixes on the table with a transition agenda for decarbonization properly agreed to and committed to by the continent ends up also tackling poverty by reaching the poorer segment of the society, it means that complementarily, we must have the continent embark on massive policy reforms of the sector. The policy reforms of the, of the energy sector is critical because in it, we would get to domestic pricing of access to energy. Today, there is a lot of discussion in the market there is a lot of technical uh, rigidities and barriers that's making that sector not an efficient sector. Uh, and so governments need to commit to the necessary reforms that will enable more efficiency uh, in the investment into that sector. And to that regard, it would mean that also the investments that support rural communities, the kind of cross subsidization that will be market efficient and yet enable rural communities to have access uh, to both off-grid and uh, on-grid solutions would be a part of the kind of bold agenda of reform in the power sector, in the overall energy sector that Africa should be pursuing. Uh, and then to close out on the basis of what Nick, both Nicholas as well as uh, uh, Shama were saying, I think it is crucial that we should have this debate around climate change from a very important lens of both science, data, and the normative concepts of equality, equity, inclusion, participation, and above all, mutual accountability. So that whether it is private sector investment or it is bilateral investment or multilateral investment, the citizens of my continent must be at the center of the decisions that are being made on their behalf. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Javier. <laughs> Fantastic final words to, to, to leave us with and hopefully for people to, to reflect on and to carry forward in, in their own work, whatever it is that they might be doing. Uh, but let me thank all of you, um, you know, the members of our, of our virtual audience here for, for showing up today and for listening to this session as well as to the previous session. Again, I remind you to keep an eye out for, for some of our future events. I already want to flag on the 3rd of February, important event on industrial policy and the energy transition in Africa and Latin America will be thinking about a number of the comparisons and, and, um, and, and lessons that can be learned from initiatives on the African continent as well as in, as in Latin uh, America. Um, we also thank, of course, uh, my, my colleague Caitlin here at the center for helping to host us and helping to facilitate this conversation. Above all, of course, let me thank 
my three outstanding panelists, uh, Nicholas Chimmer and, and Obi, for being so generous with their time and so generous with their insights, their expertise, their experience. Um, I found incredibly useful and I hope uh, you did too. So thank you very much. I hope everybody has a wonderful, safe, healthy end of the year and hope to see you again uh, soon in 2022. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Harry. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.